We are producers, engineers, singers, songwriters, musicians, tour and live production crew, and thousands more of us. Without us, the music stops. We need your help to keep the music playing. Support those impacted today at musiccares.org. I'm Nick Cucci, Executive Director of the New York Chapter of the Recording Academy, and welcome to Episode 4 of our conversation series, Live from New York. While many parts of our music community have been hit hard by COVID, surely one of the most hard hit is the live music business. Venues closing, bands not touring, when was the last time any of us saw a live, not streamed, band in concert? With the passing of the recent stimulus package and save our stages, there is definitely light at the end of the tunnel. Today, we have a group of live music experts, superstars in their own sectors, and they'll go over today the highs and lows that they experienced of this last year and when and how we can expect live music to return in New York. So I'm gonna turn this over now to our very capable moderator, my dear friend, Eric Elliott. Hello and welcome. Thanks so much, Nick, for having me here. My name is Erica Elliott, and I'm the Executive Artistic Director of the Summer Stage Festival here in New York City, and also the elected New York Chapter Secretary. I'm really excited because we have a really amazing conversation and a group of panelists here today to talk about live music. Um, so I'm going to start with just introductions and ask that the panelists go around and both introduce themselves, but also make sure that you are familiar with their organization or the venue or the business that they operate. So I'll start with Ariel. Thank you so much, Erica. Really happy to be here today. My name is Ariel Pallets. I am the Senior Executive Director of the Office of Nightlife at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment in New York City. Camilla? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Camilla Forbes. I'm the Executive Producer of the Apollo Theater. Um, in Harlem, New York. Do you want to go from there? Oh, me? I'm sorry, I was muted. Hi, I'm Alex Lomashek. I am the founder and executive director of Move Forward Music. We are a independent concert promoter, event producer, now turned live music streamer on Twitch. Great. Michael? Thanks for having me. Michael Dorf. I'm from City Winery, the founder and CEO. Uh, we're in uh, 12 locations around the country. And I started a club a long time ago called The Knitting Factory that a few people have heard of. Um, so I've been putting on shows in New York for 35 years, almost as long as Steve. <laughs> almost. Almost. Steve. Um, Steve Ben Susan. Um, I own the Blue Note Jazz Club here in New York and Sony Hall in New York. Um, it's our 40th, 40th year in New York uh, in 2021. So uh, we've been here for a long time. It's family business. I grew up in it. So, uh, you know, really well versed in New York live music scene. But we also have 10 Blue Notes around the world um, in various locations all over the place. We own the Howard Theater in DC and we book the jazz talent for the Regatta Bar in Boston. Great. So, you know, as everyone can see, this is a really dynamic group <clears throat> of live music presenters that really represent a wide scope of presentation and also um, advocacy for life and live music. So I guess we should just start with the basics, which is, you know, what did business look like in 2020? Um, in such a credible, incredible moment in time, um, and as an industry as a whole, deeply, deeply affected and impacted 
at the core because all of us are in the business of gathering people together in spaces that are definitely not socially distanced. So um, I'll just open it up to the group, but what did, what did this year look like for, for your business? Well, it wasn't fun. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you that. We spent a lot of time canceling shows, rescheduling shows, re-rescheduling shows, um, figuring out how to keep people on staff, figuring out how to operate with no money coming in. Um, and then we tried some things. We tried some streaming. We've, uh, we tried some drive-in concerts in New Jersey. Um, we even opened uh, the Blue Note as um, in a restaurant with incidental live music as per New York's uh, regulations. Um, you know, and it's just been, it's been, it's been a strain and struggle. Yeah, I would, I would add in the beginning of 2020, uh, between all of our locations, we had 1,400 employees. And by the middle of March, we were down to 80 people uh, on payroll. So an amazing reduction. And the most painful part of the year has really been the, 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 the seeing the, the trauma and challenge with our staff. Um, it's a lot of human beings that had to stop being paid. And even with the first round of PPP, it wasn't sufficient um, to, to be able to, to support such a large team. And so I, 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 the tragedy has really been with, with all of the, 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 the challenges I think we, we've all faced uh, keeping people employed uh, on top of the health predicament we're in. I would have to agree. Um, I mean, very similar. So right at the Apollo, we were headed towards a, uh, a year in which we were finishing our, our fiscal year, which ends in June with a, with a, with a really major surplus. Um, and it seemed as though overnight, uh, we saw 5 million in earned revenue gone. Um, and and, and had, to, had to find ways to do an extremely major pivot um, and part of that major pivot was it involved a combination of cutting programming, re, re, reprogramming, pivoting towards digital programming of which we established fairly quickly as was Apollo's digital stage. Um, and, um, but it, it involved a mix of furloughs uh, of our staff. Um, it involved a mix of, um, you know, we are a nonprofit organization. So it involved our development team kicking into overdrive um, and, and lobbying. Um, you know, for the continuation of our of 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 the institution and the programs moving forward. So yeah, I, you know, we we are we are in the you know we are in the mix of it, and um, as as everyone is is has, has said, and it, the saddest is is seeing the this the, the building empty. Um, uh, but as of recently, we have been able to uh, find ways to uh, be creative around programming and uh, and through partnerships uh, around streaming through the building as well. Yeah, from, from my end, uh, my business sort of turned into a daycare. <laughs> I have a three-year-old son, and, you know, um, as Camilla was saying, it's like, uh, we, we were, um, I think live music in general was doing fantastic leading up to, uh, leading up to, you know, to, to the pandemic and the shutdown. We were coming out of our best year in 2019, had a lot of exciting things planned for 2020, a big South by Southwest event that we were, like, had been working on since the top of the year. I think the, I look back um, and I think, the you know, I'm, I'm an independent promoter, so I don't have my own venue. And I'm, you know, I, I my heart goes out to all my partners. I've been blessed to to do shows, many shows in Steven's rooms and uh, and in Michael's rooms, the old knitting factory is a legendary place, one of my favorite. And also in Ariel's old, old uh, legendary spot of her own, Sutra. Um, so I had didn't have those, uh, you know, immediate pressures, but that it, immediate cessation of all revenue you know the, the week before shutdown um that last week of february we had eight shows in different rooms around new york city everything was really busy um and then you know by march 10th it was just all about canceling everything and there was you know it was like the faucet was turned off there was absolutely no money coming in whatsoever and uh you know unemployment at that time was i mean all pretty disorganized the way it was rolled out because it wasn't you know able to you know meet the the need at the time um so there was a few months there where everybody was you know 
not only, I mean, we're, there's still a lot of struggle in the industry, but those first three months, it was like completely being dropped off a cliff with no ground in sight and really not really, you know, having any idea when, when the help was coming or how long this was going to um, last. And, and it was a pretty scary time. I guess I'll, a few of you touched on it, but maybe we can talk a little bit about what feels to me one of the biggest catchphrases of, of the period, which was the pivot to digital, right? So, I mean, you all touched on it, not everyone, a little bit, but, you know, I, I think as live presenters, again, we live and breathe for having bodies in our rooms or in our venues and about that communal experience. Um, and I know for my organization had never invested, nor were we interested particularly in producing digital content until now. So maybe if you could talk about either what you did, what your philosophical working principles were, like how you as presenters of live shows navigated and made decisions around what you did or did not do in the, in the digital space in this period. And perhaps if you have a vision for your road forward, because the second part of the question is, when we do get back live, how will what we just went through and the pivots that we made affect our future business? I would love to jump in and, and try and maybe expedite a little bit. I think we all got into live streaming. Uh, we had no choice. We couldn't have people gather. Uh, everybody did different things around it. We happened to work with Mandolin and, and are doing a bunch of live streaming. I think it's both a temporary fix it and maybe will be an incremental piece of what we all do in the future. But there's no question 2020 confirmed the value of live music and of people being together and, and the value of the preciousness of the intimacy of being together with other people and the important uh, adrenaline that an artist gets from the audience and what the audience feels is that can't be digitized on the screen. And so that gives us all hope for 21 and 22 and beyond that what we do in terms of putting on live shows is something that people will pay for and the value proposition is stronger than ever because this year 2020 proved zooming and streaming and all that we're doing is okay, it's okay as a band-aid while we're in hibernation but it is not a replacement and so that gives us all a lot of hope for the future and now with vaccines and the next round of Save Our Stages, you know, the Shuttered Venue Act, we all see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I know for, for me, and I think it's the same, we're kind of shifting from defense to offense again, which is so, so, so much more preferable in terms of operating business and putting on shows to be thinking about programming and booking and, and filling that calendar every night. The biggest question is exactly when that is and then it, how that is going to look in terms of the rollout. But I think we're all excited to be moving on from kind of the the digital 2020 pivot. Um, we want to get back to live shows. Yeah, I, I, I would totally agree uh, with a lot of that. I mean, for us, the digital pivot, we, we did an exclusive deal with Twitch. Um, you know, they, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, saw an enormous surge in people signing up to create music accounts and do live music or DJ streams and music related streams because um, there are uh, uh, less stringent licensing issues as there are with Instagram and, and some other platforms. Um, so uh, we began a conversation with them and, and did a deal with Twitch where we had support from them from the beginning in terms of marketing and, uh, and just you know, placement on the platform. So we had uh, we were able to um, you know, launch our channel and we did a two day digital uh, streaming festival and uh, we've been doing weekly live shows. Um, so it's been great to have a platform to be able to support artists. You know, I think we're one of the few paying performance opportunities that people like independent and emerging artists have had. Um, through the pandemic. So that's been amazing. But, uh, you know, without without that partnership and support from the platform itself, which, you know, is a product of us having, you know, been a decade in, you know, producing and, and breaking independent artists in the live space, uh, the business model isn't really there. Um, and I think for sure, as Michael was saying, like the experience of watching a live stream, it's a cool thing to do, you know, in, as a way to interact 
with the, with your artist. But if anything, it just sort of whets the appetite for that feeling of being able to see it live because the, the thing that's evergreen is being in the same room with people that you know and people that you don't know and all getting hit with that same emotional feeling at the same time, being able to sing along together, feel the bass together, you know, like those kind of things are the, the qualities that make, um, uh, sorry about that. Uh, those type of things are the qualities that make a live show what it is and we'll never replace that with streaming. But I do think that, uh, I do think that uh, it can be an additive to what we uh, what, to what we do in the live space. Like I said, like I think I see a world where before the tour goes out, there's a live stream performance that you know maybe from the artist bedroom or from the studio or something like that. But uh, something that can can serve as a marketing tool and like an additional add on to what you're doing. Or there's live streaming from the sold out show that maybe you know it's a, it's a concert that's twenty five dollars, but there's a five dollar ticket. To, to watch on the live stream after after the show is sold out. I think that the, um, the, the one of the positives of uh, this whole horrible year that came with many negatives was that it did force us to look into live streaming and digital content as, a, um, as an avenue that's worth pursuing. And I do think it's something that can be valuable in addition to that live experience when we get to come back, whenever that may be. I think... Uh, you know, we're definitely going to continue to uh, to stream shows mainly because we see that that um, you know we have a strong following overseas and and mm -hmm. people do want to see what's going on and you know from a, a club like the Blue Note in New York. Um, the issue though I'm coming across now is um, I'm hearing from my friends at the various labels that they're they're you know being okay with everything now because everybody's closed, but the labels are going to start getting involved and, you know, wanting more control of the live stream, mainly because most signed artists don't really have the rights to do this. It's the labels who control those rights. So, you know, whether it be universal or, or Sony, whoever, I'm hearing that, yeah, we're going to let you guys do this now, but later we're going to, we're going to be involved. We're the ones that are going to, are going to control this. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll try it and, and we'll see. Camilla, interested to hear from you. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. You know, one of the points that, that I think is that in regards to, you know, obviously nothing replaces the live experience. But, you know, one of the facts I think we're all having to grapple with is that we may not go back to normal, <laughs> to what we experienced pre-pandemic. Um, um, just as a culture, as a society, um, we're all itching to get back to that, but I think there, there is a new frontier ahead of us. Um, so this idea that, you know, a big part of our conversations is how do we adopt and how do we embrace the hybrid model? Part of that adopting, embracing the hybrid model is making sure that we have the internal infrastructure for digital programming. We didn't at the beginning, you know, a lot of, a lot of our venues, we were scrambling, um, even, you know, our institutions are scrambling, trying to figure out what is the infrastructure that we need internally to make this on a, on a regular basis. Um, so that's one. Um, and number two, you know, one thing that we're challenged with right now, and Stephen, you know, your, your talk about the labels is making sure that from a, our relationships with our unions, um, are clear and concise around streaming. What are the parameters around streaming? How do we make that, um, how do we, exactly, I see you, Michael, how do we make that more, um, you know, we have a very more clear cut relationship um, that is mutually beneficial to, to everyone at the table um, in order to, you know, adopting this as a hybrid strategy moving forward, because I don't see it going away. Um, and, and, you know, we have also seen an uptick, you know, given our global audience and global reach, um, having an opportunity to touch the brand, not being able to actually fly to New York on a weekly basis. So it, it, there's been definitely some upsides to it, um, but, there, but, but there are major conversations that need to be had um, moving forward. I guess I could just add uh, as a presenter, not just your moderator, us as an organization or an institution. Similarly, you know, one of the sort of mission driven challenges was that we are an arts institution, a nonprofit that exists very specifically in New York City to serve New Yorkers. And that's what we raise money around. That's our philosophy. That's why we exist. So to then make, we made a humongous uh, shift into digital space doing over almost 100 shows in, the, in this past year and from around the world. Um, and we were happy to have audiences from around the globe be able to be at summer stage or in theory in, in our space. Um, but to the point about just who we are mission driven, 
um, we weren't necessarily just ser serving New Yorkers, right? And so as an institution, there is still, you know, we need to put thought towards both the infrastructure and, and also what the road forward is in terms of who we are raising money to serve. Um, so I'll just add, add that little, little piece there and, and also a good pivot into asking the question. So, you know, live music, like when do we actually think we'll get back to it? Um, and, and how, again, to Camilla's uh, point, like how might it be different? How are you all thinking differently about what things both need to be addressed and what, you know, patron um, concerns or, or infrastructures will need to be in place and like any thoughts that you have about when and what will it look like? <laughs> Ariel, you wanna take this one? <laughs> um, sure, I'll take a crack at it. At least, you know, to Alex's point, which I didn't mention in my, in my intro, I am a former uh, operator, uh, had a venue for 10 years. And even before that, I used to host live music, open mic jam sessions for, you know, years at SOBs and lots of other places for a long time. So I bring my experience as an operator into this very interesting and new role in government where the Office of Nightlife was created only three years ago to make sure that this brilliant vibrant, necessary industry has a dedicated representation and has a seat at the table in government. Pre-pandemic, this there were 27,000 you know, entertainment and hospitality venues, $35.1 billion industry, 300,000 jobs. And then of course, we all overnight um, fell off that cliff and what we pivoted into doing where before we were in this position to support businesses, find quality of life, support the culture, implement safe um, spaces and harm reduction, we went into full crisis management, emergency management mode. Um, and so, you know, digitally speaking, we went right into town halls and trying to make sure that this industry doesn't fall off that cliff, holding it by its wrist, you know, and making sure that it doesn't, that it, that we could find the floor um, and make sure it has the resources, support, information, guidelines. And, you know, we're all still in emergency mode. As far as what the future holds, I'm optimistic. I know that it might not look like what we maybe remembered, but I think, you know, if we do it right, I think it could be elevated. It could be more conscious. It could be um, different, but interesting and positive. And I do think um, what we're seeing not only in New York, but around the world is that strategies are being developed to be reopened, gathering that music, that base, that experience is necessary to our human condition. And so mother, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. I think what we're seeing with on-site rapid testing, um, before you go into the venue, as that technology develops, being able to go to a show an hour before, half hour before. I know Michael will have a lot to say about this and is really um, helping to pioneer this inevitability of the experience. But I think the combination of the vaccines, on-site rapid testing, at-home testing, um, that our return to gathering will inevitably happen, but I hope as quickly and as safely as possible, because it's not just about culture, it's also an economic engine that is necessary for the recovery of the city. This is not just about feeling good and connecting. This is an economic necessity. And so I think what we've seen is a change in approach or priority. Everybody was saying, especially at the beginning, hospitality, performance, live music, it's the first to close, it'll be the last to open, right? Just because of the nature of the business and gathering. But now what we're seeing is different conversations that we can no longer wait for this virus to be over and the pandemic to be over because we don't know when that is. So we have to figure out ways right now 
to get open for our mental, economic, spiritual health. And I do see that as a priority and I do see it happening and I am optimistic. Let me, I'm going to just jump in with a couple of practical comments here. I mean, one, the, the safe reopening of, of spaces is controlled by the state and um, Governor Cuomo has been very strong-willed along these lines. I've been working very closely with their office trying to push to get open um, for many months. Uh, tried to push to do outdoor shows during the summer, which they did not allow. Um, so the state has been very slow in, in allowing us to, to reopen. Even when indoor dining has been reopened to a certain extent, live music, paid live music, as long as it's um, nothing but incidental, is still not allowed by the state. And that's a, that's a major problem. Um, reopening is gonna require the, the science and the math numbers to get to a point to allow for a gathering. And when Dr. Fauci and, and the federal government all point to bars and venues as the culprit, that's gonna keep pushing back the date that the public is going to uh, feel comfortable. We're open in Nashville right now, but it might not be as safe as certainly New York and Massachusetts and, and Pennsylvania. So testing at the door is gonna be very important. There are a bunch of uh, passes that are being developed by Clear and Bindle that will become part of the protocol for admission to all of our places. They're just deciding whether or not 48 hours, 24 hours, 72 hours of uploading your test into the cloud and coming onto your pass is what you need or whether it has to be rapid at the door. Um, the vaccine rollout has been slow. And so until there's enough shots in people's arms where you can then prove you had the vaccine and you could have a, a, a COVID free space, it's gonna be very hard to have that psychological safety of being in a room with people. So, um, there's, there's a lot of practical steps that still haven't gotten there. I would say the summer, we're going to start to see some reopening of, of places, venues, outdoor dining, of course, because of the weather. And by the fall, I think we're going to be back with some limited capacity. And I think if you have fixed seated theaters, sorry, you know, Camilla and the Apollo, it's going to be harder than flexible open seated rooms where you can have reduced capacity for a while. So flexible spaces are gonna be a little more conducive to reopening safer and earlier. Um, so City Winery and, and Blue Note, few less tables um, will, will be the places that are gonna open first. Michael. One of our, one of our to even just jumping in a little uh, is, um, I'm so excited to hear that Michael, that in regards to just a lot of the thinking that has been and, and processes being put in place. Um, we are, um, great time to open new space. We have two new theaters coming online <laughs> in 2021. I, I, I chuckle uh, because it's been 20, it's been almost 15 years in the making, but those are flexible spaces. And, right. and, and we've been having these same conversations of contemplating, one, um, you know, is this the right time? Um, two, how do we make it safe? Um, how do we, how do we, and, and part of that has been, and I love Ariel, what you said is that, do you know, necessity is the mother of invention because we've been really thinking outside of the box around performance. Um, you know, obviously as a part of, we do present music, but we also present multidisciplinary arts. So really thinking about non-traditional seating, non-traditional um, ways in which we can present work, not only inside the theater, outside, um, we, we have booked an aerial dance company um, to open the new spaces that will happen outside of the building. Um, you know, so again, th I, I think that's, that is exactly it, right? What's really going to help us get open or, or really get back to the core mission of what we all do and the economic running engine running again is really, you know, thinking, continuing to think outside years until it becomes, you know, normal. Michael, are you, uh, are you seeing people come, coming back in Nashville? You said you're open there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, uh, uh, so we put a tent outside and it was more comfortable for people to be you know, in an enclosed space outside versus an enclosed space inside, just like dining in New York. You've seen these Petri dishes set up on curbside that are 
much less safe than indoors that would have air circulation and real filtration. But yeah, people were, go they were loving it because we were one of the few big tents in Nashville. Then we moved inside and it, it's really artist dependent. I think artists that feel more responsible for keeping their audience safe decline to, to perform right now and want to wait. And those that, you know, maybe have a little different political, you know, philosophy might um, uh, be much more conducive. And, and so long as we kept to our, our sort of scaled back 30% capacity and all of our other protocols, we were putting on some shows. Just recently sold out for us now is 30% in Nashville. And we did some some back-to-back -back sold out shows with some artists. Yeah, I was asking because we have our Hawaii location is open and it's been open since November and, and um, we're selling out everything. And yeah. it's all ba local based artists, but people are just hungry to come back out. Yeah. They really are. I mean, artists that I didn't think would sell 50% of the tickets and we're only at 100 capacity out of 350 mm -hmm. are just selling out. Yeah. Uh, so yes. it's amazing. And could I ask you guys in regards to even just that sort of 30% model, how, how does that affect your, your overall economic operating model? Well, that, that's, uh, it's a, uh, it's not a moneymaker. We're, we're, for us, we're, <laughs> we're trying to keep people working and break even. Yeah. Um, that's in, and we scale back our product, our, uh, our staffing, we scale back as much as we can mm -hmm. in order to, uh, to do that. And, um, you know, if, if I'm selling like we are now in Hawaii, we're okay. When we opened in New York, uh, the Blue Note as a restaurant with incidental live music at 25%, that was wasting my time. Mm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not going to do that again until we get a big, better capacity inside. Right. Uh, Understood. I think the one thing that's really encouraging, uh, and I'm, you know, it's very interesting to hear Michael talk about the potential um, COVID protocols. I'd love to hear how those, how those fit into a, a cost breakdown for for a live show. But um, the the fact that we're moving in that direction is great because something has to be figured out because the demand is definitely there. And I think that is one thing that, you know, as we were saying, you can't replace. You know, we all as presenters, of course, we think you can't replace a um, a live experience, but I think that what we've seen from other states uh, where things are open and uh, just any sniff of that people get of being able to go out, um, everything is selling out. People are dying to go back and be together and listen to music together and experience, um, experience things together. So whenever we do get the green light, I'd love to see, you know, in the same way that they're implementing 25% dining, at least, you know, start allowing some level of, uh, of live music. The problem being that with live music, having to pay production staff and pay talent, um, sometimes 25%, it's it, like, like Steven said, it's, it's not even, you know, you can't even break even on that. So it's almost not worth doing at that point. Um, but there, ha there has to be some way to gradually ease it in so that we're, we're testing things out and getting a, getting case studies about, you know, is, COVID, you know, is there a way to do this safely before we just jump into, um, you know, major festivals in the fall, be that Governor's Ball or Lollapalooza or, or whatever um, is, yeah. is coming? I would just add, I think the big, the panel conversations we're going to have in six months from now, as we start to reopen, is going to be about live music and privacy laws. And, and you know, will you allow your 23andMe DNA test to be embedded into your Ticketmaster ticket? And how far are we gonna go between our personal health records and allowance into the venue? I know as a venue operator, our job is to get butts in the seats and sell alcohol. That, that's how we pay our bills. So I'm okay you know, with less, you know, um, I'm okay with more privacy issues being, being, being broken so long as I'm filled with the club. Now, personally, I have philosophical issues with this, but this is going to be the conversation we're going to have in six months. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that, I can't wait to have that conversation. I guess we'll, we'll have to follow up and see how we can speak again. Um, we're pretty much at time, but I want to just give sort of a chance to leave on a positive note. So I'd love any and all, um, and not that that wasn't positive, Michael, but you know, um, 
just any silver linings or what has kept you hopeful or makes you hopeful about the road ahead um, and getting back to, to being live in person, presenting and doing what we all love. So if folks want to just share what their silver linings or what they have hope for, that would be amazing. And then, and then we'll wrap after that. I'll jump in since I was so such a downer before, although I don't see that as big downer. I actually think that this pandemic is one, it, it's shown the collaboration between certainly the 3000 new members of NEVO, which was created during, during the pandemic and us all working together. And unfortunately, I, and that this is, don't mean to be negative, but I think the, the beauty of the pandemic is gonna be, we're now gonna be able to focus on the next catastrophic issue of our day, which is climate change. Yeah, and I would just, I mean, I did the, all the things that we've been saying, you know, I think um, sort of uh, being forced into making a pivot and developing live streaming and digital content as more of a part of the live music experience mm -hmm. and definitely as a part of, not replacement to, um, was great. And it was great to see that, you know, belief that you can't replace live music borne out by everyone doing their different variations of live streaming to varying degrees of success and, and whatever. Um, and also just, you know, knowing that the, the reaffirmation of the need to gather and, you know, that human connection and that emotional connection to music, you know, it's, um, it's going to be there. And I think it's going to be, you know, whenever we can come back, whether that's 2022 or later this year, um, we're going to, you know, we're gonna come roaring back and, and there's gonna be a lot of shows and there's gonna be a lot of tickets being bought and a lot of fans in the seats. So that's exciting. Camilla, Steven, anything? Sure. Um, you know, I think, you know, in, in this time we have um, at the Apollo, we have an education program where we serve young people of color, where we train young people of color really in behind the scenes. Um, and, and over the, and that was one of the programs we were committed to make sure continues during this time period. Um, and I would say that was a really huge silver lining because um, they obviously had to work digitally, um, but to see the kind of innovation and um, resiliency um, that even as they were being trained, but that they brought to the table um, in, in, through this program um, was truly awe-inspiring um, because as I look towards the future and look towards, you know, who will be replacing this panel <laughs> in the future, um, I, I, I felt um, such a great deal of promise. Um, so so that, was a, that was a real awe-inspiring moment um, for the future and what is to come that we can't even imagine yet. I mean, I just want to reiterate, I mean, we, we, uh, we see numbers coming back in, at our Hawaii venue. We're looking forward to reopening. We think the demand is going to be high. Uh, but we've, throughout this pandemic, I've just had, you know, I had a lot of extra time and, and I've, I've watched a lot of free, amazing digital music out there, which I probably would never have discovered. And, um, you know, hopefully we're going to take some of what we found into some of our programming in our venues. We're already doing that. Um, so that, uh, that was great, you know, a great outcome of, of, uh, of what's been happening. Um, you know, what, what Michael said about Neva is, is, was, was amazing that we did all come together and able to pass the, uh, the SOS Save Our Stages. And, you know, that's going to save so many of, of, of us independents. So it's, uh, it's a great thing. And, you know, we're looking forward to moving forward in, in 2021, 2022. I guess I would just add that, um, you know, even uh, BC before COVID, um, <laughs> the industry had a lot of issues, you know, going into this, uh, which was part of why this office was created, whether it be the cost of doing business, accessibility, fairness, safety, um, wages, um, there were quality of life issues with neighbors. So there were so many issues that really needed a lot of attention, um, which I think needed to be resolved by ensuring that this industry is getting the support, the respect, um, and the attention it deserves, um, rather than always maybe somehow being seen as a liability and not an asset in some ways. And, um, I think this pandemic has offered 
um, an opportunity for us to be able to take this pause to reevaluate wasn't working and to be able to really rebuild um, and to sort of fix the things that maybe weren't going exactly right before the pandemic. Um, and I think part of it is because of the way that the industry, the musicians, the artists, even government has organized in a different way. And now we do see how essential and imperative it is for the health of this industry to come back strong. Um, so we're trying to figure out ways to, as we reopen and rebuild to make sure there's more racial equity, accessibility, uh, fairness, fair wages, um, and a lot of the things that really made it vulnerable to not be able to withstand such a hard blow. How do we make it more sustainable for the next time around? And I think we're on the right track to do that now. And I would just, you know, to really end on a positive note, I really do see a renaissance and a revival coming. And it's gonna be, you know, a really a time of celebration. And I think with a lot more appreciation um, for what we nearly lost. Wow. Well, that's a perfect way to end. Thank you, Ariel. That's a great last word. Um, you know, that that's our time, but I'm super grateful to have all of you in my live music community and showing up today here to share your wisdom with the Recording Academy. Um, and I thank you so much for your time. You've all been amazing. And I look forward to seeing you in person at any of your venues or spaces or shows soon. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for having me.